BioBalance HealthCast Episode 219, Challenges to Hormone Replacement Therapy that Impact Treatment. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to be having a conversation that I find fascinating and I hope you will find it fascinating as well. We're going to be discussing the challenges that are frustrating for Dr. Maupin when, when, when a patient comes in that has been referred to her, has found her by reading our book or whatever has brought them in, and they talk about their symptoms. This is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm suffering from. They, they always come in with their blood test. They have the lab test drawn before they come in. They come in and Dr. Maupin looks at the labs and then she listens to the patient talk about their symptomology and their experiences. And then if she does diagnose them with a hormone deficiency and she treats that hormone deficiency, eventually the patient frequently comes back and says, my doctor says my blood tests are normal, I don't have a hormone deficiency, so I'm going to stop. Or the patient comes back and says, I don't think I want to do this anymore for whatever reason. I mean, they, they, they listen to the media, they read some of the uh, inadequate and inaccurate press releases. But they feel better. But, but they, they feel, feel better. better. They feel and better. They All their they symptoms do. are I'm gone. I'm better now. So. I'm all better now, but I don't want to do this anymore because somebody on television said that you sh- your testosterone level shouldn't be above blank, or my doctor said, this is, this is dangerous. It's like with thyroid even, because right. I treat all the different hormones. Thyroid often can look normal on lab tests, but the patient well, has all the symptoms. I treat them, they're better, all the symptoms go away, but then the, their doctor says, well, you're on too much thyroid, so you should go off of that. It's dangerous. My thought is, so what's it going to do to me? Yeah. You should ask your doctor, if that's the case, what's it going to do to me? Specifically, not, it'll, I've had some doctors say, estrogen will kill you. Mm. Well, that's a blanket statement. It makes no sense to tell a patient that because we have estrogen in half our lives and it doesn't kill us when we're young. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of other good reasons that we've discussed that that's not true. Or your, t- your thyroid's so high that you're going to have a heart attack. Well, well that's I, I, not a personal, also not true if uh, just based on a, a lab test. A personal story for me mm-hmm. is you put me on thyroid mm-hmm. and I've been taking this for three or four years now at your recommendation and my insurance company, which I do not present that prescription to them to pay. Right. You pay for uh, it it's yourself. Not, it's not in their formulary. So mm-hmm. I pay for it myself. They're not involved in any way. And yet they look at the pharmacy records and got the information and they independently without my knowledge wrote you a letter and said, this is not the standard of care for elderly men. Which slapping my hand saying we're the insurance company we know better right. that we know better than you do without looking at anything except his age yeah and saying no 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 you can't give him thyroid because and which is insane well and when i looked at the letter i mean that's insane lots of elderly people so, have low thyroid so, so kathy shows me letter. she's i got this letter what do, you, what do you think and i looked at the letter and i didn't read any of the medical stuff all i saw was the phrase elderly, elderly man and i'm like who the heck <laughs> you know yeah, but I anyway mean, what, That's what, ridiculous. We too. wrote him a letter back and said, "Keep your hands off our medicine." And you know, we're not getting money from you. We're not asking you for money. We're not. You're and not you're involved. Not the doctor. Stay out of this. I mean, right. practicing medicine without so, a license. So those are the challenges. Yeah, it's every day, and patients encounter. are patients are either relieved when they come in and I say, "Yes, you have low thyroid," or "Yes, you have low testosterone." And oftentimes they'll say, I've been telling my doctor this for years, that I have all the symptoms. And he keeps looking at the test and going, you're fine. So why do they do that? Why do they just look at the blood test that say, my understanding is there are normal ranges. If a person Mm -hmm. is in X number bracket, then that's normal and they must be okay. And and one of the things that they do is they the way they determine normal levels is just to test test a bunch of people, mm-hmm. and then they use a bell curve. So if okay, you're so standard deviation, standard deviation. So right. they so if you're in this average level, right. they don't look at symptoms, they don't look at anything else. They just look at a group of people who knows who they tested, who knows where they tested them, right. and say if you're in this average, then you're healthy. That isn't healthy, that's just average. Because an entire group of people who live in the Midwest 
have low thyroid because we don't have any iodine in our water or our food. So if they tested Midwest people and they're in that bell curve, then their normals are wrong. Mm -hmm. And we've discussed this before. Right, we have where, podcasts that you can Yeah, find. we've had podcasts about normal's not normal. And there's a chapter in our book that deals with it. That's right. So, so if you want more information on that specific thing about how the normals are determined, then that and that's it's a big subject that's where you would go to get more information but the way lab tests should be used mm -hmm. it should be used in coordination with looking at the whole patient and his or her symptoms and getting a baseline when i'm looking at lab tests basically i'm trying to get an an idea of what's going on with the patient a snapshot from that one day of what that patient's hormonal levels and and health tests look like so that I can determine if they really need hormonal replacement. Now, testosterone levels for women, if they're in, in well above the, the my normal range, generally, if the patient doesn't have any symptoms, I, I'm not going to see her because she doesn't need me. Right. No symptoms, normal testosterone, I'm not going to see her. Same or, with men. Or if the lab tests and the symptoms are such that there's a preceding factor, you refer mm -hmm. her out to have that. Yeah, taken if, care. There's, if I find something else. And then else. say, come back later and we'll look at this when this other issue's ameliorated. So I, I look at both. I'm looking at symptoms and lab tests to determine whether I, I think a patient could be made better by seeing me and getting hormone replacement. But I also use it as a baseline. Where did we start? And what is the best level for the patient? So I'm going to note. When I get the patient's symptoms gone, and, and she or he feels great, better, normal, all the symptoms of that particular hormone deficiency are gone, then that's the level I'm shooting for every time. For that's that individual. For that person. For that person. Not for everyone. Everybody. So some, and and it's been documented, there's a there's a huge red book that's, um, that is a textbook for doctors in Britain that's named testosterone. And they have multiple chapters. When you say huge, it yeah, weighs well, 12 pounds. It does. I mean, I we carried yeah. it back from London. So, I mean, it was, it's huge. And it has tons of information about every little activity of testosterone in the body. Mm -hmm. And one huge chapter has to do with how everyone is different in how they accept that hormone. The receptor sites. The receptor sites. Okay. So we not only have a hormone level, we also, in our blood, we also have a receiving end. And some of us are very sensitive to testosterone and some of us are not very sensitive. And there's a whole gamut. They've even determined that there are certain genetic types, genetic, I guess, origins of people. You mean like Mediterranean people? Like or Mediterranean, Northern European, right. Or? Northern European ha need more testosterone, mm -hmm. that they're more resistant to it. But but as you head toward the equator, that you are more sensitive testo to testosterone. Mm -hmm. And so you may be more sensitive. You may not need as high a level to get the same outcome as someone who's so Northern European. So it's not European. a standard of 29-year-old men. It's a subset standard of 29-year-old Mediterranean genetically men and 29-year-old yes. Northern European genetically men and, and so right. on. Right. So it's it's all of these different peoples forming forming how you use your testosterone. So I'm not even sure they look at 29-year-old males for developing number, testosterone. My, my impression is that for what you see on a lab test from Quest or LabCorp or one of the other, right. the other just general labs is you see the hormone level of everybody they tested and what's what's average for that. That could even be older people because right. most people who are okay. tested for testosterone are older. So it's not exactly young, healthy levels. But you can't, I use young, healthy levels that have been established by the um, age management medical group and the A4M right. group. So we but do you use have that normals. That's a baseline. That's my baseline as normal. Right. But knowing that. Everybody is individual and different. So there's several things. So, so what I use lab tests for is develop a baseline for that particular person to have a number that confirms the symptoms and a number that confirms when the symptoms are gone. Right. Um, and to um, so, look so at... It, I don't know the numbers, but if, yes. if somebody comes in and their number is 1,000 and they have all these symptoms and you give them enough testosterone that their number goes up to 2,000 and they don't have the symptoms, mm -hmm. so then you say as long as you stay around 2,000, you're going to be healthy and feel good. Right, but that's going to be higher than... 
than most the lab test men. Score. Yeah. But that's and that it's also the test that you look at. Do you look at and I didn't I hadn't really thought about this when we were we were deciding on today's talk but w sometimes we look at the total testosterone in, in the blood mm -hmm. that's every bit of testosterone but most of that is not active so the true number that you have to look at is what's active in your right, blood right. some people have a very high number of of testosterone and a very tiny little bit that's active and genetic factors and hormonal factors go into that so it's important to look at the free, called free testosterone, to get a true view, and not many doctors look at that, and they don't know the normals. Right. Basically, the normal ranges for for young, healthy men, which well, is what and, we're and looking for. We think everybody should be young, healthy men or young, healthy women chemically. range, which yeah. is a big range. Right. So, so the reason that this is an issue is people feel better. And they go back to their regular physician for other things that they may need or regular checkups or whatever it may be. And the physicians do the blood test and they look at it and they say, oh, my God, your testosterone is sky high. What, where's this coming from? And they say, Dr. Maupin gave it to me. And they say, she's crazy. She's a quack. That's out of line. You're going to get cancer or have a heart attack and die. Come off that hormone. Which is totally wrong. It is wrong. And, and we... We, and we constantly cite the And we have all kinds. I mean, the, yeah. there's three articles in the Journal of Metabolism and Endocrinology from the past three months. Uh, and it was in one journal that all say that testosterone and growth hormone, which testosterone stimulates, is good for aging males. Of course, they never test females. Is good for, prevents heart attacks, prevents frailty, prevents... Um, uh, um, Alzheimer's, prevents dementia, prevents, I mean, osteoporosis, all of these things. And, you know, does that ever hit the headlines? No. I mean, it's, it's crazy I, that we see this in research and then out in the world, doctors are being fed this metabolized piece of information, usually from media. Not always from media. Not I tell an interesting story about Kathy. When we were promoting our book, we were in Florida uh, to do some book signings, and Kathy was invited to give a speech to a conference of medical doctors. Oh, man. And she gave a speech about what she does, and she's talking about this in her speech, about the diagnostic issues and the dosage issues that frighten a lot of physicians who don't know what she knows. Now, these physicians are all forward-thinking. This group of physicians... They're trying to expose themselves to all this Yeah, change. they're trying to look for the newer thing. So it's not like we're looking at you know the 80 year old guys that don't want to think right. about this all of these physicians in this room thousand physicians want to know the newest thing in the cutting edge so, so, go ahead. so when the speech was over and people were gathering around to talk to Kathy with questions or just say nice job whatever this one female doctor who is a research scientist not a practicing physician but she's a doctor she teach she, uh, she teaches a little right. at a medical school but so she that came up makes her an expert histrionically challenging Kathy to say you can't use that that much testosterone. You can't do that. That that's a, that's wrong. And Kathy was like, "Do you practice medicine? Do you have patients?" No, but I've done research studies. Blah 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 blah. And Kathy said, "I've done 10, 11 years of thousands, thousands, on and thousands, thousands of, of patients. living patients who experience improvement of symptomology and don't develop any of these aberrant illnesses that you're worried about." And so, so the, the reality is, she is a different form of testosterone was, than I do. She but. was like a little terrier, I and mean, she was barking at this guy like, "You don't know what you're talking about. I'm a physician. I have a practice. Stay out of my business. I know what I'm doing." And good for you. I had to stand. Well, I had to stand up to her. Well, you did. But she has all the power because she's on the board of in that, that organization. In that group, she may. So you may but, not get invited back. But the doctors well, that listen to you. Oh, the doctors that listen to me get it. I mean, they were and very excited about it. And many of them came up and said it. the same thing. They yeah. said, oh, my God, that validates what I have experienced and I've been with doing. my patients. Right. Yeah. So oh. it's – and it, but, he, but if you want some meat to put behind your argument, if your doctor does this and says, of course, they don't, you know, they don't know – this is kind of a new new view Knowledge of base. hormones. So if they don't know this yet, so some of the things are, I'll give you the reasons that the testosterone or any other hormone level does not equal the, the symptomatology. Lab the lab normal doesn't equal feeling better or getting to a, a place where you are cured. I mean... How often does your doctor say to you, do you feel better, instead of, oh, your lab's normal, see ya. You know, that's a big problem in physicians. We look at lab instead of looking at the patient. But here's, here's what you can use 
as arguments. One is lab tests aren't repeatable. I, I have had several people get a testosterone level and I order total testosterone and free testosterone. So sometimes they get a test that has total with free attached and one that has free with total attached done different ways from the same lab on the same day with the same blood. Totally different levels. Mm -hmm. Totally different. So I'm not sure how I, how trustworthy the lab those labs are. Right. And I've, it, this has not happened just once. This isn't like they tested somebody else's blood. They just did two different ways of looking at testosterone. So maybe other hormones are better or more repeatable, but I doubt it because I, I've had a couple have two thyroid levels and they were completely different on the same day with the same blood. So that's one issue with doing blood tests. I'm not saying blood tests aren't the best test out there. They are, but these are the problems with the blood test. Blood normals may not be healthy for that individual. That, As we talked about, that bell curve may not be, you may not be in that bell curve. You may need more of something or less of something because of your genetics and your receptor sites. Here's, here's the most important thing for you to take away. The blood level that you have it has 10 steps it has to go through or more, depending on the hormone, before it activates a cell. So it comes out of a gland, like say your thyroid. So a thyroid hormone is secreted into your bloodstream and then it has to go through 10 different machinations or, or changes before it can actually activate a cell and it has to get into the cell. So when we test the blood level, we're just looking at that first blood level that comes out of your uh, out of your um, gland. We're not looking at all of those different things that have to happen to it to make it effective. So it's like the Washington D.C. subway. When you get on in Silver Springs, Maryland, and you want to go to the Capitol, you may have to take three or four transfers. Right. And uh, the, when it comes out of the gland, That's a great... it may have to take multiple transfers to get to the target cell. And th that means that there are multiple things that can go wrong between your blood level and turning on the cell. Yeah. So in certain things, we have a marker that we look at. Instead of just looking at the blood test, we look at the patient's temperature because that tells me what happened in the cell, not what the blood level is, but did it actually get to the cell to activate the nucleus, to activate the mitochondria, everything inside the cell to make the temperature of the body go up. Mm -hmm. So. That's why I look at the outcome often when the blood tests don't match the patient's symptoms. And that works very well for thyroid, but we don't have a lot of other markers like that that we can test like a basal body temperature. We can't right. really test something that's obvious that a patient can test at home. So, But that is something for you to think about. And then I'm gonna go over the steps on what has to happen. but. We talked about receptor sites as well, so that's number four. The receptor sites have to be able to get the hormone, and you have to have enough receptor sites that are available, and they have to actually work. Now, here's the things that can change the effectiveness of the hormone. You and I have talked about all these things, which are, one, one is poor absorption. Mm -hmm. Many people are on Prilosec or Zantac or something to decrease the acid in their stomach. So if you're taking a hormone, and it is, and you don't have enough acid, you may not absorb it. Or if you've had a, a bypass for obesity, you may not absorb that hormone what if from you don't your take medicine. hormone through your stomach, if, if you take pellets, for instance. Right. So pellets in general are the best way to get anything because, because they're you absorbed. Avoid that complication. You avoid that. Okay. And so you can avoid, but we can't give thyroid that way. Right. And we can't give cortisol that way. Or natural or, or bioidentical cortisone. Mm -hmm. So so that's something you have to think about when you're taking a hormone orally. Then you have to think about how much does it bind to a protein. Most hormones are are in your blood. Some are at, some part of that hormone is active and some is inactive, as we discussed. That's a protein binding thing. If you have a whole lot of a protein, like if somebody takes estrogen orally, tons of binding protein that binds up both estrogen but also binds up testosterone. So the more oral estrogen you take, the less active testosterone you have. So looking at a total testosterone level doesn't tell you anything. You have to look at the free testosterone level. Then there are antibodies that attack the hormone. And we've talked about that before. Antibodies that like attack a thyroid hormone or attack the receptor site. Mm -hmm. So it, it can actually 
change your hormone so it doesn't work. It can actually change the receptor site so it won't accept your hormone. But if I give you a hormone, then that will work because it's different, a little different than the one that you have. And the antibodies won't be formed to it. Okay. So, so there's a greater chance statistically of getting through to its destination. Right. Okay. Right. Just just like the subway. Right. So um, down regulation, I don't know, that's a term that is very hard to think about, but if you've heard about insulin resistance, insulin resistance means that the cells that you have are resistant to the hormone insulin. Mm -hmm. So you're, if you have insulin resistance, you can make the same amount of insulin as somebody else, but you're going to have a whole different action. The insulin can't get in the cell. So insulin resistance is a precursor to diabetes too? Yes. So you it develop is. the resistance first. first Your body says, hey, we need some energy. Send us some sugar. Mm -hmm. And the cells say, well, we're not accepting sugar today. Right. And we're not accepting insulin today. Insulin piggybacks sugar into the cell. Right. So if you don't... So if you don't take the take, insulin, you, you don't, don't get the sugar if piggyback. If you don't have insulin right. that actually can attach to mm -hmm. the cell, mm -hmm. if it's different, if it's changed, or if it is at the receptor site level, it just doesn't... It's resistant or down-regulated. I'm sorry, you're not a member. You can't come in. It's private yeah, club. That's yeah. right. Or we're just going to take a few of you. Yeah. You know, so you get a little insulin and a little sugar in, and then what happens to the rest of that sugar? It makes fat. The more fat you have, the more insulin resistant. So it affects the receptor sites. Right. That's called down-regulation. And so that's something that we deal with with testosterone. Often we deal with thyroid. We deal with a lot of things. So when, when we do that, sometimes we have to give a whole lot of a hormone to get the effect that we need. Going through, um, there's enzyme defects. All these little stops on the subway require an enzyme, an enzyme to work. What if one of those enzymes isn't working? What if you genetically can't do it? That's what happens in a lot of the cholesterol medication or cholesterol, excuse me, illnesses that are familial. Your enzymes not working at a certain age, right. so you can't metabolize your fats properly. Well, that happens to hormones as well. So you can't get from the blood level to the cellular level. So oftentimes we have to flood your body with more hormone mm -hmm. to get there, or we have to do something else, give you another hormone to actually make that happen. Interestingly enough, you know growth hormone, we've talked about that right. before. Growth hormone is stimulated by testosterone, so we usually don't have to give growth hormone. We usually stimulate it and then the patient gets enough growth hormone. But as we age, growth hormone goes down. Growth hormone is necessary for the enzyme that takes thyroid T4 and makes it active T3. Okay. So if you don't have any growth hormone, your growth hormone's low, you're not taking testosterone, you're not exercising or something else, you're taking a medication that blocks it, then you can't make your inactive thyroid to your active thyroid. That's a hormonal reaction on that enzyme. So it's a switch that doesn't throw after a certain age. Your, your thyroid's making what it needs to make, then there's supposed to be a switch within it that triggers it when it needs to come on, and mm -hmm. that switch is not working anymore. When it needs to transform into the active form, right. that enzyme isn't isn't working because there's not enough growth hormone. So how many of you have light switches in your house, and the light's burned out, and you know the light's burned out, and you still find yourself going over and hitting the switch? Right. And then you look around like, oh, that light's out. I need to replace that bulb. Right. But the switch is there, and the switch works, mm -hmm. but the light doesn't come on. And that's one of the reasons why thyroids work better after right. we give testosterone. Because thyroid, we give testosterone, it stimulates growth hormone. Growth hormone then stimulates the transformation of, or tra the transforming of testosterone, or excuse me, thyroid 4 into thyroid 3, the active form. So having said that, that's another issue is if you don't have enough hormone, of some kind, not the one I'm looking at, but another one, you may not be able to make that change. Well, these are all things that th they are, and, and they're things that you can talk about literally nonstop for three days. Thank you. Uh, I've heard you do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, but, but let's let's review for a minute. What, what we're discussing that's important to you, the viewer, uh, is that in Kathy's practice, people come in because they've found their way to her, they feel bad, and mm -hmm. they come in with. Uh, the paperwork filled out and the lab test completed. She has those results when they come in. She interviews them, spends time with them, listens to them, and she may uh, diagnose them with a hormone deficiency, which she then recommends and provides treatment for. Outside 
physicians who don't know what she knows, your, your private physician, general practitioner, whatever, will sometimes get that data from you and panic. Uh, recommendation is have them call Kathy. Let her, let her explain her, her thinking and her reasoning and her knowledge, or have them read our book, The Secret Female Hormone, which explains a lot of this in, ta- in detail, or listen to this podcast, because the, the information is out there, but it's not their specialty, mm-hmm. and they don't know. And so it isn't that they're doing something bad, it's they're being uninformed. And so it's relevant to you to be an informed consumer and Mm -hmm. not to challenge them in an argumentative way, but to challenge them in terms of saying, well, I hear what you're saying, but I feel better. And she tells me that I'm not going to get cancer because I'm taking this, and I'm not going to have a heart attack because of this. And I'm, and, and the research is there. And she, you can find it on our website, uh, or you can read our book. Um, and so can your doctor. So please don't just give up and walk away from your opportunity to feel better. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.